episode 38 of Red versus Blue. My name is Mike Stark. And I'm Keith Curry. And we've been away for a couple of weeks. Keith has been out there getting tanned and uh, rested on a vacation. And are you tanned and rested? I'm tanned. I'm rested. But I could use another one. I think since we've been away for a while, we need to kind of bring things up to date and go back to the beginning and kind of look at where we've been and where we are now. And the twists and turns have been unbelievable, right? They have indeed. As recently as June, just a couple of months ago, Biden and and Trump were engaged in trench warfare. Neither side was moving the needle very much. There's a lot of growing anxiety on the Democratic side about Biden. So Biden decided the way to break out of trench warfare is to challenge Trump to a debate. He figures that a debate strategy, once you get him up there, hit his triggers and make him like implode. And that actually turned out to be a strategy that had some (laughs) logic to it. The unfortunate part for Mr. Biden, though, is that he blew himself up during the course of the debate. It exacerbated all of the concerns about his age. Democrats in mass, beginning with Nancy Pelosi, began to escort him to the door. And he was off the ticket in about three and a half weeks, replaced by Vice President Harris. Now, in the meantime, Trump had some remarkable good luck. Somebody took a shot at him and missed. His sentencing was postponed. One case was dismissed entirely. He had a string of success in the courts. He had a pretty good Republican convention. It looked like he was picking up more states. He was making other states like Virginia and New Hampshire become battleground states. Then Harris got into the race and things immediately turned around. Harris uh, regained all of the uh, lost Democratic vote and enthusiasm, raised a huge amount of money. It's still pretty close. But then they had the debate. Yes, they did. I'm listening to you tell that timeline. As a Democrat, I was thinking of all of the ups and downs that I had during that period. I think on this show, I said, Democrats have lost. I think I actually said that. And uh, now they got a shot at it. It's It's amazing how things have changed. Just about every Democrat, beginning with the people who know best, Carville and Uh, Axelrod and others all came to that same conclusion that, you know, Joe Biden is going to lose in the election. His campaign is not salvageable. We need to do plan B. And to their credit, the Democrats mustered enough intestinal fortitude and organizational ruthlessness to implement plan B and put Harris in the race. And to her credit, she's actually, although she has avoided a lot of deep policy discussions and a lot of media discussions in general, has been a good candidate and had five fabulous weeks as a candidate during which Trump was unable to get his bearings and was stumbling and mumbling and fumbling and not really making uh, much ground. And then capped off by the debate. We're going to try to maybe put a little different twist on it than everybody else has, but uh, let's just talk about right off the bat, the good moments and who actually won. Well, for the beginning 11 minutes. I'll stop you there. Some say 30. No, it was just 11 minutes. (laughs) It was like the Haley DeSantis debate. Two good candidates going toe-to-toe, making their positions known, talking about the issues, drawing distinctions. Both of them were fairly sharp. It looked like they knew what they were doing. And then there was a question. And let's remember, the question had to do with the border, a question on which Trump ought to be able to sit back and go, how am I going to score points on this? And she goes in to answer the question and sort of, gives a cursory answer, blames him for killing the bill, and then brings up his crowd size and says people are leaving because they're being bored. 64 million Americans are watching that debate. 64 million Americans say, okay, she just sit the hook. Is he going to take it? Three, two, one. (laughs) Yep, he took it. And off the rails he went. And we then had a discussion on crowd size, And for some inexplicable reason, on a question regarding the border, a question that he should have done very well on, he brings up cats and dogs in Springfield, Mm -hmm. Illinois. And as we've said before on this show, Mike, if we've learned one thing in this campaign, stay away from bears, cats and dogs. (laughs) And he went right at it and he never recovered. And she was there sort of laughing and mocking him. And from that point forward, she just pressed button after button after button. And he just self-imploded. So that was the first bait she put out. But then she put bait out through the whole debate from that point on, right? 
She chummed him on the military. She chummed him on his staff uh, and his administration personnel who have opposed him now for re-election, for world leaders holding him into contempt. And he just continued to take it and dig himself a bigger hole. And I will tell you, not since Gary Hart told the press, listen, if you think I'm fooling around, go ahead and follow me. Has a candidate engaged in more self-destructive behavior than Donald Trump uh, on the debate stage. Now, I personally think you ought to send Robert F. Kennedy Jr. to investigate the cat eating thing because that's his resident in-house expert. As it is, he had an awful debate. So to answer the question, who won? Flash poll showed she won by 63 to 37. Trump showed a Newsmax poll that showed he won by 96 to uh, four. So apparently uh, they, they used the same bolster that Putin does in, in Russia. But no, no reasonable person believes that he did himself any good in the debate. And in fact, he did himself uh, quite a bit of harm. Here's the thing, Mike, too. Not only were 64 million Americans watching the debate and watching her so easily manipulate him and push his buttons by his ego and narcissism, but every foreign intelligence service in the world was watching the debate. And you can just see the guys in the Kremlin. He punches the guy in the arm and says, see, I told you you can manipulate this guy. All you got to do is just push the button. Yeah. And there he is. And here's the situation. Biden is no longer in this race because the American people reached a collective decision that he did not meet the threshold qualification of being able to do the job in terms of his mental acuity. And there was a great movement of people uh, and a substantial amount of Democrats who said, we need somebody else. Trump is now on a knife edge of being in that same situation of people saying, listen, we can't tolerate this. He's not up for the job. He's not you know, mentally strong enough to resist being baited. And if that happens, there'll be a a big sort of fall off. Now, the dynamics in the parties are different. The dynamics of the disability is sort of different between Biden and Trump. But the same issue is very present. And of course, for millions of Americans, they've already reached that conclusion that he is simply not qualified or eligible to be president again. A lot of people actually who served in his administration, and they've moved on. They may not have necessarily moved to Harris, but they've moved on from Trump. So that's the uh, knife edge he's on. And that's why uh, he's announced he does not want any more debates. Yeah. And let's talk a little bit about the Republicans that are moving over to the other side or at least saying they're not going to vote for Trump. And let's start with the recent editorial that happened after the debate done by Karl Rove. Karl Rove is one of the smartest political managers on the Republican side. They called him the architect back during the Bush era. And he just basically said that uh, Trump blew himself up, showed himself to be unfit, and uh, had an awful debate and was awfully prepared. And and he understands. Everybody says we should fire the debate preppers. Uh, It's not the fault of the debate preppers. It's the fault of the candidate whose mouth is moving on the stage. Karl Rove really called him out on it and said that it was a train wreck. I was originally dismissive of the Harris effort to appeal to Republicans because there's nothing inherent about her that is appealing to Republicans. However, she has put together and highlighted at her convention major Republican endorsements. She's got Liz and Dick Cheney. I know a lot of Democrats don't like Dick Cheney, but he is, for what passes, as the Republican establishment. When I went to Washington in 1982, he was one of the guys I interviewed with when he was in the Republican congressional leadership. And he was the vice president of the United States. No former vice president or president on the Republican side has supported Trump. So she is making legitimate efforts. She has got good people doing that. And the Republican Accountability Project, the Lincoln Project, the old Never Trumpers are still very active and and working. I get an email every day about why Trump is not the right choice for the Republican Party. So whereas I said she may get 4% of the Republican vote, uh, that number may jump to six to seven percent. But I think you're going to see a significant amount of Republicans who choose not to vote. That's two choices now. Do you vote for Trump or not and leave the place blank? Or do you not vote for Trump and vote for Harris? Uh, Not voting for Trump and voting for Harris is a bit of a reach for a lot of Republicans. But not voting for Trump is much less of a reach. And I think you're going to see a lot of Republicans uh, leave the top of the ticket blank. And that will have very significant implications for Trump. And I'll just tell you, Trump's not reached out to George Bush. He doesn't really want it. Right. So that just tells you that right away that uh, Trump's campaign is not built around running to the middle. Now, to her credit, Harris is at least attempting that. 
I mean, she's abandoned with wild abandon many of her positions. Her economics are a little bit fuzzy. They're best described as, I'm going to give you money. And she's laid off her tax plan, which was a disaster, and her subsidy plan, which is going to drive up uh, inflation again. She can't do that throughout the entire campaign. But let's give her credit for modifying the Biden policies that were the most toxic and for moving to the right. Biden had this problem. He was nominated as a moderate, nominated as a centrist. He was the anti-Bernie Sanders candidate. And therefore, he always had a problem on his left. So he always had to placate the left Mm. and never really was able to take advantage of being the centrist he wanted to be. Her problem is the mirror image. Everybody knows she's a leftist, but she has the ability to move to the center, which is much more politically advantageous to her than moving to the left was to Biden. Yeah, and we talked about this early on, about how in the general election, candidates tend on both sides to move to the middle. And and that's what she's doing. That's exactly right. And she's doing it with a, a fair amount of discipline. We saw that in the debate. And people who thought that, you know, she serves up a word salad, which she does occasionally, and that she can't think on her feet, I think need to uh, reevaluate that analysis. I thought she did a, a pretty good job as a debater. And she certainly did an outstanding job in baiting uh, Donald Trump into blowing himself up. Now, we need to bring up one other point that we brought up early in the uh, show, almost a year ago, I guess, is the Taylor Swift effect. Taylor Swift uh, ought to run for office herself. She's got great political timing, right? An hour after the debate, she made the news, put it out there that she's endorsing Harris. She said, this is an important election. People need to vote. I'll be voting for Harris. 400,000 people logged on to vote.com or whatever the the website was she told them to log on to. 400,000 people will make a difference in this election if they're in the right states. So that was hugely important. That helps her get to a a voter block that's primarily been disengaged up to now. And I think it could be a very, very uh, significant endorsement. Yeah. And 9 million people liked her post on Instagram. That's right. And I don't think the wrestlers and Hulk Hogan and all of those guys are going to uh, successfully counterbalance that. (laughs) Well, good for Taylor. She did it in a classy way, too. She talked about Harris's value and didn't really knock Trump down all that much. She did. And that indicates some political smarts on her behalf or some good advice to handle it in a way that makes it more effective. So where do we go from here? Where does each campaign go from here? Well, there is some good and bad for both sides. Let's take uh, Harris first. Harris nailed down the nomination. She had a phenomenal six or seven weeks uh, out of the box of just great press, you know, not very tough media, wrapping up endorsements, raising a huge amount of money, taking over the Biden organization, having a great convention and coming out in, in great shape, whereas Trump was rumbling, stumbling, bumbling. He was not able to make the pivot to Harris very effectively. He had uh, some more court cases he had to be at. He made some more personal self-sabotage comments in front of a microphone. He got all bollocked up in dogs and cats and other weird stuff that comes out of his mouth. So it was a phenomenal period of time for the Harris campaign. That said, the race is tied. It's tied in the the swing states. It's pretty much tied nationally where you expect for Harris to have an advantage in the popular vote. Here's the troubling thing for the Harris campaign is despite all of that that happened, she is behind where Hillary Clinton was and she is behind where uh, Joe Biden was at this Mm. same point in time in the 2016 and the 2020 elections. Uh, Now, there's still time for her to win. The betting odds are still on Trump, actually. She has put North Carolina into play as an additional swing state that wasn't in play before. Swing states that Republicans thought they were going to be able to compete in, like Virginia, uh, New Hampshire and Minnesota are no longer in play. She's pulled ahead in Arizona and uh, Nevada and those states. But it's going to be a dead, even campaign. She has got to uh, get out there and define herself on the economy and move to the middle in such a way that moderate voters, independent voters get comfortable with her. And there's good and bad facts on both sides in terms of going into the stretch. For the Republicans, Republican registration is up across the country. It's up even here in California Mm. by significant amounts. It's up a million votes in Florida. So you've seen a huge amount of people re-registering as Republicans. So it's all going to come out to turn out and who's got the best organization. 
She inherited the Biden organization. They've got a lot more offices. They will have a lot more money around the country to do the nuts and bolts of precinct walking, identifying and getting out the vote. Again, Trump has, you know, pissed in his own bed and, and poisoned people's minds to voting early, voting by mail, voting in alternative ways. And as a result, Republicans are all going to vote on Election Day. And you better hope if you're a Republican, it's not cold, snowy, rainy, windy, or there's a good show on TV uh, that makes <laughs> you not get out and vote. Right. So from an organizational standpoint, uh, that's an advantage uh, to her. Although she had a good debate, she didn't yet make the case on policy. She was too superficial on that. Uh, she's going to have to get pushed on it. That's an opportunity for her to screw up. But I'm impressed by the discipline she showed that she will not screw up and that she has got advisors who are telling her to you know, stop the craziness, move to the middle, stop the bad economics, move to the middle. Don't make people think you're going to cost them money when they go to the polls. And if she can do that, she's going to win. One other thing that's going to happen is that Trump is going to his sentencing has been postponed until after the election. But in the federal case, the special prosecutor will outline all of his evidence. And so the Trump trial is going to dominate the news again in a way that will not be favorable uh, for Trump. And there'll be ongoing hearings on what evidence can and can't be admitted given the presidential immunity part. So I suspect that the news from the courtrooms will not be good for Trump. And of course, last week he had a diatribe uh, against E. Jean Carroll once again. She may sue him a third time. And uh, he just can't let that go. And will there be another debate? What is your guess on that? Well, of course, he has now said there's not going to be another debate. And just about every political pundit says, wait until he gets five points behind and he'll be on pounding the table demanding a debate. And I think that's about right. It'll be too late for him, really, at that point in time. And he'll be flip flopping because he's going to, I think, start to trail. And the trailing candidate will, will demand a debate and he will take the risk that because he believes in his own ability to speak, to do another debate. And, and if it's like the last one, he will put the nail in the coffin. His coffin. Right. Now, a debate, would that help Harris at all? Another debate? Harris has the risk of she can't really do much better than she did. So from her perspective, right. why risk it? On the other hand, she's demonstrated that Trump is congenitally unable to handle the kinds of criticism that she was able to dish out, and he will continue to blow himself up. So I think she has a little bit more risk here. She can stay above the fray and just go to the voters with her message undiluted by having to stand next to him. But she gets the advantage of saying, hey, Trump says he doesn't want to debate. I'm happy to debate. Let's debate. And that just prods him a little bit more. And Trump is in this no man's land of if I don't debate, I can't gain ground. And if I do debate, I'm going to blow myself up again. And so his staff has got some hard choices. OK, I think next week we might have some additional polling that will show the effect of the debate better than it may right now, right? I think so. Most people think that she won the debate. There, one poll showed maybe a five-point movement. I think that's going to be too much. Somebody showed me a poll the other day that the battleground states are still within one point of each other. So we'll see if there's any movement there once things sort of settle out and people have read the commentary and watched the late-night shows and uh, sort of digested it a little bit. I expect it's still going to be very close. It's going to be a turnout-driven election. So those who can get their voters out is the party that's going to win. All right, we're going to close with this. George W. Bush has not jumped into the fray. He, it doesn't sound like he's going to commit one way or the other. Now, the other Republican I know that uh, really hasn't uh, committed in one way or the other is... Uh, a gentleman named Keith Curry. Well, I'm proud to have in common uh, so much with the former president, uh, Bush. <laughs> uh, and I will say that he does not really need to compromise his ongoing viability as a Republican leader by endorsing the vice president. I will say that 200 people who served in his administration, in Reagan's administration, his father's administration, and in Trump's administration have already come out and said Trump should not uh, be elected. There are two decision points, uh, to use the title of, uh, I think, Bush's book, Do You Vote for Trump? A lot of Republicans, including me, and I've never voted for Trump, have already got to that point. That takes one vote away from Trump. The second point is, do you vote for Harris? Some Republicans have gotten there. The, the Cheneys have gotten there. Adam Kinzinger, 
more than I would have thought, frankly, because she is intrinsically not attractive to Republicans. She's still got some wood to chop with independent voters and suburban voters by moving out and, and, and changing and modifying her economic policies and giving people some comfort. She's not crazy. And the fact that it looks like Republicans are now leading in two Senate seats means we're going to have a divided government. And so a President Harris for the Republican Senate is a kind of split government that makes me feel pretty good. But uh, no, I'm waiting for the bait to be dangled. My phone is right here. I'm waiting for the call to see if it comes. <laughs> but I'm not but there yet. To your defense, Keith, it doesn't matter in the state of California anyway. Where it matters is in those swing states. And that's where those uh, Republicans moving over to actually voting for Harris would make a tremendous difference, right? And I will guarantee you that those phones are ringing. <laughs> And well, their mailbox is full and their TV is jammed and they can't go to the store without somebody accosting them at the front door with a brochure and a, and a, and a thing. <laughs> and I'm sure Air Force One is going to be involved in free flights pretty soon. That's hilarious. We'll await on your final decision and uh, we'll be back again next week for another edition of Red versus Blue. Thanks, Keith. Be sure and uh, subscribe to the podcast. We're going to be here till at least Election Day. We might go over a few weeks afterwards, and then we may have some plans after that. We need to huddle up on that and decide what we want to do. But uh, we're here for at least until the election, and we hope you join us. Subscribe to the podcast and like our Facebook page. Leave us a five-star review on iTunes, and uh, we'll see you again next week. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, everybody. Bye now.